Is this going? Yes, it is. Hi, everybody. Um, I can barely recover my breath, and I have seen this film before, but it is just so tremendously moving. Um, I'm Laurie Lefkowitz. I direct the Jewish Studies program at Northeastern University. And um, at the end of the film, when it says that some of those children are in the audience tonight, indeed, <laughs> Eva Paddock is with us this evening. She was three years old when she was transported from Prague. Um, she and I have had a chance to speak over, over Zoom and over dinner. And uh, we share um, we share Czechoslovakia in our family history. My father was also a child um, in Czechoslovakia, though his story is a different one. He was liberated from Buchenwald, and it's just an immense priv privilege to have gotten to spend time with you and um, and speak with you. So I won't say more right now, except to uh, facilitate the opportunity for Eva to tell us her story. So I'll start simply by asking you, Eva, I know you don't remember the train trip, you were three years old, but if you would share with us something of what you do remember from the years following the Foster family that took you in, and just situate us in your own family story. I will, but I need to stand up. I don't do well sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, thank you all for coming. Is this on and can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, I need to, while everybody catches their breath, I need to tell you that I was not in any of those camps. My family lived in Prague. We were upper middle class. My mother was a physician. And um, in ways that I do not know, she learned about Nikki Winton. So um, my, my looking at this film is not as a documentary, but it's as a lived experience. And I have to tell you that those scenes of people waiting out of a hotel Schrobeck are, are accurate. And that, that my mother was in one of those lines and she took photographs, uh, a, a photograph of my sister Milena and myself uh, to Nikki just as you saw them. We were very, very fortunate. Um, we were fostered by a, a wonderful Lancashire family. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Ratcliffe, who became known to us as Mummy and Daddy Ratcliffe. Um, Daddy Ratcliffe was on the, on the station at Liverpool Street, just as you saw, and we um, lived with them. I'm also very fortunate in that I was, Milan and I were two of very, very few children whose families, whose parents survived. My parents escaped separately. Um, other stories, of course, my mother arrived via Norway in 1940, um, and we were reunited in Lancashire. So, you know, my background is very, very fortunate and much different from many of the children that you saw depicted in this film. Um, and I have to say that I think the film is very valuable um, in many ways. It, 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 depicts the humanity of one person, and it also shows us what one person can do if they are determined to help in a situation. So that's one of the, the takeaways for me of the film. Eva, can you say more about your relationship with the family that took you in, if you understand what motivated them and um, the connection, if at all, between the two families, your family of art, your biological family, and your foster family? Yes. Um, so, um, Mummy and Daddy Ratcliffe, I, I can't, have, I have to talk to them about that, that's who they were, uh, were um, working class people in a mill town. They lived in a two up, two down, which is a, a terrace house. That should be self-explanatory, two up, two down. <laughs> they had um, a daughter who was 16. And in those days, um, at 16, you were already working. And Mary was working in the mill. And they were going to take the one child. I think they found the photographs 
uh, through their church. The, the, the photographs went into the picture post, they went into newspapers, they went into church communities, um, and they were going to take one child. And they saw the picture of my sister and myself. I was really, really cute in those days. And <laughs> they decided that they couldn't separate us, so they decided they would take two of us. Um, and you have to think about that, that we were on no sell-by date. You know, they were taking two children whom they could have necessarily kept forever. And Mary went to live with Grandma, who, went two street, who lived two streets away, um, so that they could take us in the second of the, of the bedrooms. Um, we maintained a relationship when my parents, finally we were all reunited in Lancashire, in Ashton Underline, um, the community found us uh, what's in England called council houses. We would call it public housing. The houses we were completely well taken care of, um, and we maintained a relationship with them th throughout their lives. They came to my wedding. They met my first child. They took my parents in as friends. They taught my mother English. We played a lot of games of something called lexicon, close to Scrabble, but not quite. Um, but they were absolutely wonderful. We were extraordinarily fortunate. Uh, true confessions. Lady Milena Grenfell Baines is my sister. Um, and um, and um, the film company, Hawes, I give them enormous credit. They were very, very sensitive to the making of this film. And uh, towards the end of the, the making of the film, they reached out um, to find any relatives or descendants or anyone who had anything to do with the movie and invited them to become extras in the film in that last scene um, where everybody stands up. And my son Simon, um, who is a retired art teacher, my children are very old, uh, um, <laughs> who is an art teacher, retired in Gloucester, went to London, and my nephew, Milena, lives in, in England, uh, George, they met up in London, and they are extras in this film. And if you know where they're sitting and you don't blink, you know, you actually see them. But I, I usually, usually miss them, but it makes the film a little bit extra special, yeah. That, that's just extraordinary, Eva, that, um, I mean, the, that you stayed in connection with this family all those years and, um, and that they took care of all of you, not just the children once your parents turned up. Um, what's so uh, heartening about your own story is that it's a story of being reunited. Um, with your sister, I, you didn't even tell me that she was uh, Lady <laughs> Granville. So I, I, I yeah. got. I, I have to. I have to. I do want to say that the documents that Milena showed um, uh, um, were were given back to us by the Radcliffe's many, many years later, long after I was married. My mother said, "Oh, by the way, Roland gave me all these papers about you." So we each have the label. My number was six three nine. Her was six three eight. We don't know why. Um, and my documents I have given to the Holocaust Museum for um, safe, well, you know, for, for posterity and for proper management. And my family, uh, we, I did that with their permission, rather than have them sit in somebody's drawer for, the, you know, who knows how long. And they, they are now available for anybody to look at. Um, and the family can actually go and ask them to re bring them out of the archives. And in that, in that, in those documents, there is the 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 actual printing printed printout. It's not a printout, a mm -hmm. type paper uh, on Gestapo headlines that said, you know, as of I think it was April 2042, that we are now confiscating the property of the Jew Rudolph wife, Eva Milena, uh, with the dates um, in behalf of. Um, you know, the, the Nazi state. So we, if there's any doubt about who we were and where we were, those documents are, are well represented and can be used for research, which is the reason that I have chosen to give them over. Yeah, part of what I think broke my heart most um, powerfully in this film is the, is the separation, the parents who were brave enough to separate from their own children and that, and you know, when, one finds oneself wondering, what would you do in such a circumstance? Would you 
hand your children over not knowing your fate and if you'd see them again and then to see the siblings separated so I think your own story is a strong counterpoint to that um, but the other you know is a Professor of Jewish studies, I mean, I saw so many Jewish morals in the story, especially the, the repeated sentence that if you save a single life, you've saved the whole world. But what the TV show showed was the sort of exponential power of saving a single life, because from the 600 some odd children that were saved were the 6,000 that are living now, thanks Thanks. to their having been saved. And um, I just, I guess I want to ask you about the way this early childhood experience shaped who you became. If you think of yourself in relationship to that um, childhood. My mother was a survivor too. She spent the war years in Siberia. And I remember once as a teenager saying to her, you know, the suburban lady with her fancy nails, mom, I can't believe these stories are about you. And she said, you know, actually, I have trouble believing it too. I feel like they're someone else's stories. So how much, how integrated is this childhood in the Eva who grew up and came to Cambridge, Massachusetts? And Uh, that part of my life was really on the back burner. Um, I was brought up in a family with absolutely no sense of victimhood. My parents never talked about what they lost. The, The only time I, um, remember my mother being irritated um, sort of about things that happened was with her friends who wouldn't leave because they couldn't leave, you know, their house, their goods, their whatever they had. She had very little patience with that. Um, so I was brought up and without this story being part of my active life. And in fact, growing up and even through my adulthood and through my professional life, I was not at all interested in having my past identify who I have. You know, I have grown up, I have children, I have had a career, I've had a perfectly excellent life. But I have to say the film has completely blown that out of the water back into the, literally, uh, into the present with, in a completely unexpected way, um, and has reminded me so gutturally um, what people like myself owe to Nicholas Winton. And I think the film um, is important because not only does it do him justice, but again, I come back to that thing, you know, once an educator, everybody an educator, <laughs> that the film needs to be seen in the context of what people can do to help other people um, with, without a committee. I mean, I, I have met Nikki a number of times and talked about different things, and literally he took a piece of paper that said the Czech committee, the, the refugee committee for um, Czechoslovakia, and he took the piece of paper and he added children's section, got himself a stamp, stamped it, and made himself the secretary, you know, and I like that. <laughs> and and I have realized that there are many moments where I would, and I probably still will, um, do a Helena Bonham Carter and sit down, young man, you know, I, I like that. <laughs> and. That's how it worked. People, I'm reminding people that you don't need a committee, and I'm reminding children that I speak to, you know, you just get up and do what needs to get done. I, I think that's just an extraordinary takeaway from the film, and I love your tribute to the work of art as having a kind of power in the world right now. I also um, love your... Um, underscoring of the characterization of Nicholas's mother. I just love that mother. <laughs> um, and, I, and you just mentioned in passing that you met him um, in the years since. I'm wondering if you had met him before the making of the film or if the film was the catalyst, I mean the making of the, the TV show. Um, if that was the catalyst and what you, th- if you were there for that occasion and what all that was like, the yes. exposure on television and that, you know, this is your life kind of story. Yeah. No, I would, I, my, my husband and I came, I traveled a lot and we came and settled by choice 
um, in Cambridge in 1965. That's a long time ago. Um, my sister continued to live in England, so she was on, she was there. Um, at the, you saw that. One little anecdote is that um, the phone rang at her house, and this voice said. Um, she was not a lady at that time. She, she became a lady later because her husband was knighted for services to architecture, actually. Anyway, she answered the phone and this person said, this is Esther Ranson. And Melina said, yes, and I'm the Queen of England. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I mean, totally unexpected that Esther Ranson was a very well-known TV personality. Um, so she was there and Milena and I, I was able to watch the program. My, my mother watched the program and I have, when I meet, the, I'm going to New York to, to the real opening, um, the real premiere in the, of the US in next, um, on Thursday, and I have to challenge um, Director Hawes because the scarf that the woman wearing who was supposed to be my sister was not nearly as attractive as the <laughs> as the real one that I gave her and if you you can actually YouTube the original um, iteration of that program and I still feel it's very well worth watching and it still makes me cry so go on go to YouTube and see that it's wonderful. Was was he as humble as the film represents? Ab absolutely. So when, so um, my family here did worked constantly, or we did, to make sure that we didn't reinvent history and that our children grew up knowing their relatives and had some roots. So we traveled a lot back and forth. Our children went every summer. One went in summer to stay with my mother, with my sister and so there was a, a, a lot of a lot of connection and having seen once we knew who Nikki Winton was Jim and I were going to London and Nikki lived in Maidenhead I said we would like to come visit um, for a cup of tea and Nikki's wife Greta said no 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 nobody comes here for a cup of tea you come for the day so <laughs> that's what we did and again they were so sensitive to the needs of us to bring some sort of closure and understanding to this event. Um, after we'd had lunch, Nikki said, Jim, you're going to come and help me wash the dishes. And Eva's going out in the garden with Nikki. And that's what we did. And I started to try and, you know, say, oh, thank you. And he said, no, no, no. Tell me about your life. And that was absolutely who he was. That's what he wanted. That's what had happened. Uh, a remarkable man. Um, and one last thing, because I think we have to be out of here, otherwise we, we're going to we be, have seeing, a, we have we're be seeing Dune or something. <laughs> um, um, that when that, there was a train replication of the trip in 2009, and I was on that train with 22 of the original travelers, and we had been helping the, with the organization, and um, Olga said, when we get to London, will you just hop off the train and go and tell Nicky that we're here? We knew that he would be, he was waiting on the station. It was his 100th birthday. So I, I did that and ran in the background and tapped him on the shoulder and said, are you ready? You know, there's a lot of people coming. Yes, I'm ready. He said, I'm just glad I don't have to find you all digs for the night. <laughs> so so I, I, think that, I think that tells everything about Nikki yeah, Linton. I mean, what I also loved about the characterization of Nikki is not just the humility, but the, the persistence and the chutzpah and, the, um, as, and his mother as well. And, and the other um, observation I wanted to make is that um, we're in a moment of found stories because how technology has allowed us to come find some kind of closure for stories where we never might have imagined that you would know what happened to whom. But between the digitization of archives, which allowed me to find relatives I didn't know existed um, who survived in my grandfather's family, and that led to a plethora of reunion stories. Um, and the and DNA testing and all kinds of things. And I, I guess I, but this is now the literature person <laughs> in me wanting to know about whether this did give you a sense of closure on a certain detail in your life and if that was important in any way. I think it made what happened in 1939 um, more remarkable than it had been before. How can I put that any better? Yeah. Okay, with that, I think we should, 
probably have to stop. Uh, I, you know, I think we can wait for the uh, people really? who want to throw us out to throw All us right. out. <laughs> you know, in that case, I'll use the minute since we are, um, um, we do, we, we were given very strict um, orders to not overstay our welcome here. Um, but I do want to say that um, Northeastern University has, since 1972, um, had a oh, that's my water had a Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Week of programming that every year includes the testimony of survivors and from year to year it gets more and more difficult to make that happen but we are very privileged this year to have Eva Paddock come and tell her story more fully so if this has whet your appetite for um, Eva to to hear Eva tell the story more completely I have to remember to pronounce her name correctly. Um, that's on March 27th, and I do have some flyers, so just catch me afterwards. And we always um, also have a scholarly event um, and bring someone who is expert in this field as there's more and more discovery. Um, and this year, our speaker will be Zoe Waxman, who is going to speak about rape and reproduction during the Holocaust. And I'm so sad to say that it's just too timely, um, that topic. And um, our theme is uh, mothers and children this year. So um, I just would encourage you to visit our website and see when our programs are, or, or catch me with some flyers. Is, is that going to be li only live, or is it going to be t um, it, on uh, um, Zoom or I whatever? believe that your program is just live. Um, and we don't have time for questions, right? Um, I, if, is there anyone? I'm sorry? We can go ahead? OK. So it, it, you want to take some questions? Watch for, my watch. Yeah. Is, if there is, I, I was thinking because it was so dark in the room that I wouldn't open to the audience, but if there's, um, do you have a very big voice? Oh, yes, I do. OK, please. Ask my husband. How long did you live with the foster family? How long did you live with the foster family? Almost a year. Uh, a year. Almost a year, um, yeah. Another? I thought I saw a hand down here somewhere. No, it's good. That's good. All right. Oh, yes. Please. Big voice. Uh, it sounded like you went back to Czechoslovakia, but did your mother ever go back to Czechoslovakia? No, no. We we remained in England. My my family became more British than the British. Not with accents, they always had accents, but in terms of feelings for the country, they were incredibly grateful to the country for letting them in. Um, my father actually in 1945 had um, an appointment with UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Association, to go back to work in their offices, but at that point, he recognized that the country would become a communist country because of how um, the end of the war, certain countries got to be liberating certain countries and then they owned them and Czechoslovakia was liberated by um, the Russians and his answer was I don't need to run twice. He, he knew that he, he couldn't possibly live so we, we stayed in England. Yeah, And I've then we've been back and forth many times and all my family have been there and they, they know that they know where we lived and in fact in, in um, at the end of April, I'm going back to the Czech Republic. Um, the, the village that we came from has arranged to have what are called Stolpersteins. Those are... Uh, the stumbling stones. Yes, the translation stumbling stones, which you'll find in Europe, not just in Czechoslovakia. Um, these They're important in Germany. It's done a lot of them, yeah, I'm sorry? in Berlin. That's where they started, but they're also in Poland. They're in... in, in a, most of the countries that became occupied, and they are installed outside the homes of um, Jews who disappeared. That's kind of the small villages around Prague. There's been a lot of movement to um, document what happened to the families who disappeared, because there were many, many Jews who just, you know, Vanished. There you are, vanished, vanished. And so now this is happening, and so we're very privileged and honored that the people in the village have gone through quite an extensive process of documenting, and um, you know, you don't just say, I want one. So they've done all the paperwork, and we're going to um, an installation of that in, at the end of, of uh, April. 
Uh, it's extraordinary. You have immense energy. I'm so um, admiring of your powers of articulation and telling your own story and, and also the takeaways from the film. And I also, um, one, of the, one of the other takeaways for me is that Nicholas Winton decided that he wanted to resurrect this story after a lifetime of philanthropy to tell the story of refugees at a moment in time when ref there was another refugee crisis and he thought that this history could matter in the present. And I just say that without further comment, but um, perhaps we're in such a moment now. I loved it when he slammed the door on that news on the little newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were yeah. several terrific moments that way. So um, please join me in thanking Eva. Thank you.